lot of the same ideas we heard here about 5G deployment. Um, I'm Sasha Segan from PC Mag in the US. And of course, in the US, uh, we are having a moment with fascinating and fascinatingly different 5G deployments happening soon. Uh, we have four major wireless carriers in the US, and each of them is deploying 5G uh, in different spectrum, with different use cases, in different ways, and in ways that often don't look like 4G and don't look like the existing 4G networks. Now, fortunately, we have some great experts coming up uh, who are going to be able to talk about uh, innovative 5G deployment strategies globally and how it is going to look different from uh, 4G. So first, I want to invite up uh, Dr. Uh, Kibi from uh, China Telecom, um, who can really talk about the 5G standard setting process and uh, the broad picture of, uh, of how carriers are going to choose their 5G deployments. Thank you very much for coming up. Yes, uh, thank you. So one thing we were talking about before this started is the big question of SA versus NSA. And now, of course, coming from the States, I'm used to the carriers saying, uh, oh, well, we have to be early on this. NSA, non-standalone 5G, is the way to go, at least in the early phases of 5G development. But of course, um, your company has just committed to an SA rollout. And I'm hoping you can tell me why choose SA over NSA and uh, what are the factors involved causing a carrier to choose one over the other? Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, actually uh, SA and NSA is a uh, very uh, complex uh, issues and uh, China Telecom has done a significant amount of uh, uh, investigations and uh, studies and uh, try to choose the one uh, that's the best for our customer. And uh, we are actually very excited about the, uh, our 5G uh, launch uh, that's expected. Uh, and uh, we believe that the uh, standalone, the SA uh, options will enable uh, China Telecom to provide the true 5G experience, and which is uh, very important. And uh, the N uh, SA uh, will be able to uh, uh, provide uh, URLC uh, uh, low delay and uh, uh, reliable uh, uh, communication. That's very important for our uh, uh, vertical customers. And uh, China Telecom actually is one of the uh, company has a, a most uh, strong relationship with uh, verticals uh, in China. And we believe that uh, the uh, true 5G experience uh, provided by uh, SA will be uh, good for our customers. And also, uh, as we know that everyone has the uh, uh, final destination, which is actually SA. So the NSA is actually a transition, and it's uh, uh, come from the uh, fact that uh, at some, mom some time in the standardization, uh, there were uh, a risk of uh, divergence of the uh, 5G and therefore, in order to do the uh, uh, convergence, they did a uh, acceleration. So this is really a, uh, the, uh, the middle step uh, transition uh, point uh, for the uh, uh, SA. And however, in China, we believe that uh, China has a big population and also has a growing uh, uh, economy. The growth, of the growth, growth rate of the economy is much faster you know, in, uh, compared uh, with other countries in the world. And therefore, we believe the transitions uh, uh, from NSA to SA will be relatively very short. And therefore, uh, we believe that uh, by one stop to the final destination, that uh, in, enable us to uh, uh, serve the customer better and have the least interruptions and, uh, uh, or the upgrades needed for uh, the LTE uh, 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 system. And uh, also another uh, consideration uh, for use SA is to promote uh, competition. And uh, uh, with NSA, uh, one of the uh, unexpected effect is the link, the close link between 4G and 5G systems. Uh, that will uh, make the uh, 
business proposal uh, slightly more complicated because uh, you would uh, be forced to use the uh, old vendors. With the uh, choice of SA, you basically unlink that uh, uh, 5G with 4G, and uh, uh, China Telecom would be able to uh, uh, use uh, the whatever the chosen vendors, and that promote uh, the uh, competition. And I think that's a very uh, will be very good uh, for the uh, uh, growth of the 5G. So, so in addition to SA, actually, you know, in a few days, China Telecom has uh, uh, announced the white paper, and it spelled out the clear. Uh, directions for the vendors and we hope that will be helpful for vendors uh, to focus on their effort to the uh, uh, areas that the service providers and uh, service providers need so now you, you mentioned several times that uh, that you're focused on uh, particular uh, potential vertical customers and industries uh, for the to be customers for the initial 5G rollout. Now, does that mean that you're focused more on low latency applications than on EMBB, or is EMBB still uh, really the focus for initial 5G users? Uh, we believe that uh, EMBB is uh, definitely the uh, uh, one of the important focus of the industry, and therefore the focus of China Telecom as well. And uh, uh, verticals are going to take time. Uh, however, we believe that the new revenues are from the verticals. And uh, uh, as we know, that uh, the uh, apples for all the service providers, including China Telecom, has been uh, flat uh, over uh, many years. And uh, however, uh, that's actually the biggest revenue from the EMBB. Therefore, EMBB will definitely our emphasis and the focus. And that you cannot take the eye off the EMBB. And, uh, also, as you know, that the 3GPP actually focused a significant amount of effort on EMBB. So that's clearly our focus. However, we also believe that in addition to EMBB, the new money that comes from the URLC and the verticals. And uh, uh, because China Telecom has the strongest relationship with the verticals compared with other service providers, we believe that uh, the additional focus on the uh, verticals will enable us to uh, do better. Now, you were mentioning earlier that uh, doing SA allows you to work with new equipment providers. And of course, we have uh, one of those equipment providers here. I'd like to bring him up, uh, Thomas Noren, uh, the head of 5G commercialization for Ericsson. Uh, Thomas, why don't you come up here? Great. Good to see you. So um, just continuing on what Dr. B has been saying, um, you're European. And uh, of course, in Europe, some of the operators have been saying that, oh, EMBB is not a good enough business case to justify the capex for building these 5G networks. Um, obviously, you think differently. And uh, where are the operators going to recoup the capex is it going to be in the short term as a lot of EMBB customers come online? Is it going to be in the long term as we're looking at these verticals? Uh, and how does that shape the deployment? Okay, so f so first a correction. It's true that I'm born in Europe, but I happen to be multinational. So okay, uh, and so is Ericsson's business. Um, anyway, so. Um, um, of course, many operators face this challenge. How can we motivate investments in, in, um, in 5G? We just completed major rollouts of 4G. That's the problem. Now, it turns out that the, one of the major problems for, for, uh, for operators is you know, the, the um, very high data growth, but very limited uh, uh, income growth. Mm -hmm. So we need to find ways to handle that enormous capacity that is coming up uh, every year, growing by 40, 50% per year, and at the same time, provide that data at an affordable cost. So with, with 5G, we can take down the cost per bit to about a tenth of what it was to introduce uh, 4G at the time. And that will be needed because the traffic is going to grow so much, but people will not necessarily pay a lot more, a little bit more, we believe, because of more advanced use cases for mobile broadband. But we need to take down the cost per bit. So the first use case for 5G is that. 
And we find that together with our operator partners that the most efficient way to do that is to in also introduce 5G. 5G has inherently a couple of features that, that addresses the problem. You know, you come with new spectrum that is very wide. You come with a massive MIMO technology from the start, which uses the spectrum more efficiently, and it's inherently a little bit more effective. And those are the reasons why we can take down the cost per bit. Now, I know you brought a slide with you, and uh, I would be neglectful not to mention your slides, so let's, let's throw that up. Okay. And uh, you can talk about uh, some of the opportunities on there. Um, whoever's got the slide. Yeah, it's over there. Uh, it's over there. Okay, okay. great, great. So, so on the uh, lower left-hand corner, you see what we just talked about, you know, enhanced mobile broadband, lower the cost per bit. The good news with this area is, of course, that this is where operators make their money today. It's a very large business for, for all our customers. And people have great needs. But the challenge is with this, with this use case is that it doesn't, it doesn't grow particularly much. The other three, though, have, you know, are opportunities, and the opportunities will vary in different countries depending on what the market looks like. So, if you take the, uh, the the right lower corner, the fixed wireless access, in many parts of the world, and we heard one example in the earlier panel, uh, you know, that was in in, uh, in North America. Um, there are homes that are not well connected or very poorly connected. So, uh, 30 million homes just in the United States. 40% uh, of homes in Europe are not uh, uh, connected at all or have a very poor DSL connection. Wireless operators can address this segment with, with 5G if they do it right. If you, if you focus your investments in the areas where you can compete with fiber and where you have a, 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 a revenue base to, to capture. So I think this, is a, this brings in new revenues to the market. On the IoT side, if you take the top, um, top left corner, a massive IoT, that's for sensors, uh, that is for uh, electrical meters, things like that. We have a great technology that you can roll out just as a software component on your existing networks with narrowband IoT and CATM for 4G. So since this is just coming about for 4G, uh, operators are starting to explore this, not least here in, in China. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is another opportunity for growth. The nice thing about this area, it's, it's actually growing pretty well for operators. You know, some 15 to 30 percent is the growth rate for this area. Some operators start to show this as a separate line in their annual reports to demonstrate their growth. The only challenge is it's still growing from a re relatively small base. So it's only 2, 3 percent of operators' revenues today. And then you have the top right-hand corner, and that's, I think, when the the, some of the unique 5G capabilities come in, but that we also see will, will happen with, with 4G, and it is the digitalization of industries, where you go in and you put 5G or 4G to start with in, in manufacturing plants or in oil rigs or in other venues where you want to digitalize and drive efficiency. And in this space, you know, there is a lot of um, uh, gains to be made in terms of productivity. We start to see some very good examples already. And, and the 3 gp technologies have the unique capability of both providing very low latency and high reliability. There is no other wireless technology that can do that. So I think this is a good opportunities. So now you mentioned, you mentioned relatively early on that uh, there's going to be a massively greater amount of data going through this network, and uh, that's going to help lower the cost per bit. Of course, one of the concerns there is how we're going to manage that backhaul, and fortunately, we have someone else here who can absolutely talk about that. Uh, Steve Greaves, the CEO of uh, CCS, Cambridge Communication Systems. Uh, please come on up, Steve. Thank you. So we've been talking about uh, we've been talking about all these new new use cases. We've been talking about massively greater amounts of data. Uh, it just feels to me that this is going to break the back of existing backhaul uh, if that is not accounted for. How is backhaul going to need to change for these five G uses? 
Well, sure, it's, uh, it's broken the back already. So we, we have a current product that's 1.2 gigabits. It was a very new product brought out a year ago and already it's out of date, okay? So uh, how does it cope? So we have to develop new technologies. We have to evolve with the standards. So we have to move quite quickly. So we, uh, we look at, as a small company, we look at what's out there. And I think the most important thing for, for us is that the uh, availability of components, availability of components is actually, uh, if not, if keeping up with the standard, if not in front of the standard. So there are components out there that we can utilize that will enable us to develop technology ready for this, which we couldn't have done five years ago. For instance, phase array devices. Phase array devices require a huge amount of investment, but we can now utilize people that invested things for, fi for Ygig, you know, moving on to other frequency bands, so we can leverage technologies that would have cost millions and millions of dollars to develop. So we get those chipsets, and they will be commoditized before we start to deployment. So these depl the devices are sort of $40 in volume. Uh, network processors, we're working with network processor companies, 50, 60 gigabits of switching infrastructure with vector processors for six single processing uh, and network processing devices, which is so powerful that I mean small companies like us can start to develop new technologies. So our latest version of our system runs at 16 gigabits per second, okay? And that's developed in about a year and a half. Our 1.2 gigabit system took us about five years to develop because we had to do it all ourselves. So I think by leveraging the, the wider ecosystem that's beginning to develop and beginning to be out there, we can develop technology, backhaul technology, that will keep up with uh, the requirements of the standards. So that, that's, I think, what, what we have to do. And I think uh, small companies like ourselves are quite innovative. And we do work with people like Ericsson. Uh, Ericsson resell our products sometimes, <laughs> if we're lucky. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, uh, working with, with the big companies and the big mobile vendors, so mobile operators understand this. And in the UK, for instance, Telefonica have invested in, in CCS and developed the products. And we now have a deployment within the city of London that's small cell and small cell backhaul. So I think by by leveraging the wider ecosystem that's out there, I think, and, and using innovative ideas, we can keep up with, if not exceed the requirements. And that's how we have to work. We have to keep running faster and faster and faster. So now, uh, because, because uh, 5G is going to be so dependent on dense networks of small cells, how important is uh, municipal buy-in and how important is municipal cooperation at the local level to having a satisfactory 5G network? Well, I would say, uh, and this is from experience, it's absolutely imperative that you do that. And I think historically as an industry, we've left that aspect behind. I remember being involved with the Sprint and SoftBank in the early days of their million small cell rollout in the US. We were over there, and the first people to get up and speak in these meetings with them were lawyers. Lawyers saying, well, we have to sue this municipality, we have to sue that municipality to get access to the polls. It's crazy, that's never going to work, and it didn't work. They didn't deploy many. I think they deployed about 200 of the things. So take an example of the UK. The UK, uh, I think, is a great example of how things should work. So the UK is, uh, under the DCMS, is developing 100, 100 million pounds of investment to the municipalities to then develop 5G test beds. So you bring them in at a very early stage because they've got the assets you want, okay? So you have to have them on board at a very early stage. Otherwise, I think we will never deploy any of this technology we, we want to deploy. And now, uh, one other technology I heard you mention that I, that I think is interesting because uh, when we think of, when, at least when I think of 5G, I often think of millimeter wave. And uh, YGIG is a technology that's been kind of floating around in the millimeter wave bands for a couple of years now. But it sounds like it's going to be more critical, uh, both from a backhaul and an access perspective, as 5G happens. Um, can, uh, can, can any of you guys uh, talk about the, role, the potential role of YGIG uh, in cooperation with 5G? Well, show you. <laughs> so I brought, this is our. 60 gig backhaul product, this is 16 gig gigabits per second. It's based on 802.11 uh, AD, 
but we've had to modify the upper Mac layer in here to, to, to enable it to work properly. If you look at what Facebook are trying to do with AY, they're trying to get coordination and synchronization across the whole network. Once you have that capability, what you can do is you can manage interference. You can control the, the scheduling of the, the transmissions such you, you can deal with the dense urban deployments which are interference limited. Not just interference from external sources, WAGIG will have a lot of that, but also from your own source. I mean, there's a lot of reflections. We have a deployment in the city of London, 28 gigahertz, it's, it's massively multipath, okay? You've got lots of multipath. In fact, 30% of our links are non-line of sight just reflections, okay? We didn't design it like that, but that's how it is. And you'll know that from your FWA program with the, with the 28 gigahertz. So I think why gig is important because A, the spectrum's free, okay? That's hugely important because it enables new, um, new people, new businesses to get in, involved with this. For instance, we're working in the US with people like Charter. And these are big companies, Windstream. They want to run their own backhaul networks, but they have no access to spectrum, okay? So at the moment, 60 gigs is the only option. I think CBRS in the long term is a very powerful, powerful sort of uh, methodology for, for uh, freeing up spectrum. I think that's an important thing that needs to be progressed. But at the moment, 60 is a great, um, a great access technology, I think. I, I think um, you are absolutely right, Steve, that I think the in interference problems is something that's very critical to manage in the, for a reliable service. And you know, when we talk about the advanced services and what people expect today, your customers expect today, it's not something that almost works or almost works every time. It has to work. And I think therefore there will be multiple solutions for, for backhaul and, and transport as well as, uh, as well as front haul. We think it's very important that we manage the spectrum carefully, that you don't waste it and uh, have uh, undue uh, use of it. The people or the organizations that have a right to use the spectrum should also really use it because it's a natural resource uh, that must be taken care of. And operators have done a great job in, in doing that. And I think we believe that licensed spectrum is therefore in a very important uh, uh, part of, uh, of the future because with a natural resource like that, it must be managed very, very carefully. Well then, if, if you're mentioning license spectrum, uh, let's bring in our last panelist who deals with an area of license spectrum that most mobile providers uh, haven't touched up until yet. Uh, that's Piero DeVito from the European Space Agency. And now, uh, Piero, I have to say, I was I was surprised when you were added to this panel because as someone who has been in, uh, been in wireless and been in mobile broadband uh, for many years, I think of, I think of satellite and uh, ground-based mobile broadband as uh, two groups that don't frequently meet. But satellite's going to have a much more cooperative role in 5G, right? Yeah, well, um, the, uh, I step in in the terrestrial world um, since Barcelona. And the thing is that, yeah, indeed, I work for the European Space Agency, but don't think about satellite. We, what the program where I work for, we provide funding and expertise to develop services, downstream services. So services you use, we use, and that use at least one space asset. So you use more satellite than you would ever think. Uh, you would ever believe in everything you do. Um, so, for example, in uh, in what will happen with connected cards, when you update maps, you can use Earth observation, or when you use your Google Maps, or in he health or in um, people mobility, or in when you think about smart airports, and um, thinking about. Um, for example, if we move into the aviation domain, when we work a lot with um, uh, big stakeholders and organizations like the European Maritime Safety Agency or Frontex that use the UAV to provide maritime surveillance, uh, in that case, the utilization of satellite is crucial uh, to provide beyond the radio line of sight flight 
um, or another example is um, now we're looking at the unmanned maritime system, so unmanned vessels. Uh, you can imagine that when you move to maritime world, the satellites do play a key role uh, because you need uh, navigation, so the positioning, but you need also to transfer data and, of course, the control. Uh, this is these aspects are equivalent for both aviation and maritime, but we see application of satellite also in agriculture applications, for example. We have so many services that the industry developed to use uh, to monitor crops, and they integrate the use of UAV with earth observation. Um, so we have identified so many use cases, uh, because in the program where I work, we have so many domains where we see the application of satellite. Uh, and its integration with the terrestrial networks. That's the key point, uh, is that the when you move, you, you come down from space and you work with downstream services, so you work with the users, you really realize how these two words can work together and needs to work together. Um, they already do it. Uh, so we expect and we believe that they will do it more and more with the 5G. And we are aware that there are several challenges uh, our role is to support industries to overcome these challenges. And we're really keen, and that's why I'm here, to try to create a strong bridge between the terrestrial and the space world for any type of applications that really can span from maritime to aviation to agriculture to EL to, to transport uh, to, to any of the use cases you're interested in. Um, in particular, what we are really keen is to support development of commercial applications uh, that present a strong potential to uh, have a strong business case and uh, that indeed can really exploit the terrestrial and the space network. Now, uh, as you may are aware, the European Space Agency uh, is based in more in Europe, uh, but the reason for which I'm here is that because all the application and services we, we are helping to develop are deployed worldwide. And uh, we're really keen to support the cooperation with uh, any area of the world and in China as well. Um, so we don't, we don't have any limit in terms of constraints or regions in this sense. And this is another key point. Now, Dr. B, is there, is there anything inherent about uh, the design of the 5G standards or uh, was thought about in the 5G standard setting process uh, involving uh, bringing space assets uh, into uh, to be used more easily by traditional terrestrial networks. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, currently, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, satellite vendors are uh, working in 3GPP uh, in collaboration with the uh, uh, mobile industry to uh, look into how we can uh, combine the uh, uh, traditional mobile communication with the satellite uh, so that uh, we can have uh, uh, a much uh, uh, smooth and uh, better communications. And I think the uh, work is uh, still in progress and uh, China Telecom is very uh, uh, interested in this area as well because China Telecom is the one of the software providers that has a satellite license in China. And I heard it's actually uh, the only uh, service provider has a satellite license. So uh, we are looking into uh, how we can uh, combine the uh, mobile communication, especially 5G, with the satellite uh, areas. So that's definitely the area we are looking at right now. Now, uh, Pierre was also talking about uh, was also talking about certain agricultural uses um, and maritime uses, and that got me thinking about what I think is one of the more one of the more radical concepts in 5G, which is the, uh, the, the heavier use of network slicing and private networks, um, much more than in 4G, as, as far as I'm familiar. Please tell me if I'm wrong. Um, what role, uh, as, as, as operators deploy, um, how should they think of enabling uh, potential private networks for enterprise customers like this, and how does that change the shape of deployment uh, from what we've seen with 4G? Thomas, I, you look like you have the idea there. Yeah, I, I, think, I think we will see multiple different type of solutions. Uh, with slicing, operators can start to serve unique enterprise needs in a completely different way, and that will certainly be one of the mainstream deployments where you can guarantee quality in a very different way or have 
uh, ultra low latency uh, slices being set up for certain applications that will be required by companies. Uh, I also think that we will see a, a much greater deployment of private networks. If you have, for example, if you're running a, 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 a car manufacturing plant, you produce cars, you are so dependent on not having any production stops that you might want to have an entire network on premise because you don't want to depend even on a fiber uh, transport back to a core network that an excavator can you know, dig up. That will take a long time to, uh, to fix and you, know, you would stop production for a long time. It's some, something not acceptable by these companies. So there I think you will see a lot of more dedicated deployments. You can see other areas, for example, if you, if you have a, a coverage on an oil rig, that is necessarily to be done on a, you know, a, a dedicated network. So I think we see much more, a great, much greater variety of deployment cases than we've seen so far. It's not only wide area mobile band in the future. Now, Steve, have you talked to any enterprise customers or any kinds of enterprises that are interested in the idea of 5G private networks? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, Cambridge University, uh, I, I'm from Cambridge. Cambridge University deploys more Aruba Wi-Fi small cells than anybody in the UK. They're the biggest importer of them. And they've been trying to get, this is not just 5G, just mobile coverage across. Imagine, if you imagine uh, uh, you, Cambridge is actually a city within a university, if you, if you know what I mean. So, so it's a big area and it covers uh, both public and private areas. And, and a lot of the times they don't have the coverage they want from their conventional 3G, 4G network. So they've been moaning, been moaning the fact that they can't get uh, Telefonica or Vodafone to commit to doing this. They'd really like to build their own network. So that there's, not a, uh, there's not an imperative there in the sense that they, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a requirement they, they could do it other ways. But they, they're network guys, they just want to build it like a network. So they like to buy services in from somebody. They like to buy the core services, maybe from somebody else. They like to have maybe a neutral host model that delivers that capability. So, I, and also in the US, I think we find a lot of the, uh, the, the cable companies uh, that we're dealing with uh, really are interested in developing their own uh, versions of mobile networks. The issue there is spectrum. Okay, where do they get the spectrum from? The same with the university, which is why I think 60 is important in that scenario. But I also think the shared spectrum band, for instance, the uh, CBRS 3.5 gigahertz band is very important in that context. Also, the 37 gigahertz backhaul band is, is maybe a shared band as well. So that's why I think shared spectrum, as well as licensed spectrum, is quite an important thing to enable these new models to flourish. Uh, uh, and I think the, uh, the other thing that I think was quite interesting that uh, I had not particularly uh, um, considered too much before I came was the presentation by China Mobile, the way that the, the mobile operators are moving to a, a more um, converged and open, open standard platform, which means that that will be, open this capability up to these, um, you know, these users. So I think 5G and what's surrounding 5G, the, you know, the, the next generation network is really going to enable this. But I think spectrum's an issue, and I think possibly the sharing of the resources is an issue to enable that, really. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and also I think uh, uh, one example uh, I think uh, we, we have is actually the uh, a hospital campus. And in China we have a lot of large hospitals uh, with uh, multiple buildings, uh, almost like a campus environment. Uh, in which they actually uh, require uh, uh, the combined service, not only the uh, uh, mobile communication uh, 4G and 5G, but also combined with Wi-Fi as well. Uh, that's a wild uh, application. So China Telecom as a, a uh, integrated service provider with both wired and wireline communication, uh, we serve the, uh, a lot of our uh, enterprise customers uh, in that regard. So in that case, uh, they not only need uh, to have a slicing for a particular application, but they wanted to combine that with the Wi-Fi and also unlicensed band so that uh, they can use uh, proper technologies for proper applications. And uh, uh, we have a, a department uh, specialized in verticals, uh, and we work with them uh, very closely, and uh, we see a lot of need for that as well. Now, um, Steve was talking just now about uh, I guess uh, more more convergence, more commonality in technologies between operators. And uh, Dr. B, I especially want to ask you because the Chinese operators, of course, um, in the 2G, 3G world, uh, used very different incompatible RANs. And as we move to 5G, 
do you see more commonality in RAN between operators? And therefore, do you see more, uh, more uh, options like shared RAN and uh, different deployment strategies that take advantage of the fact that everybody is going to be on one NR system and there isn't going to be all this TDS CDMA around? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, indeed, that, that there were uh, several different uh, competing technologies in the older generations, and uh, we all went through this uh, uh, divergence. And uh, uh, fortunately, for 5G, there is only one standard worldwide, and therefore, uh, uh, all the software providers would be using the uh, same uh, technology. And uh, uh, therefore, the, uh, as far as the uh, uh, sharing is concerned, and uh, indeed that uh, provide service providers are actively uh, considering uh, the shared uh, uh, deployment strategy, and uh, uh, because of that one, you can uh, uh, more quickly build build out the uh, network, and uh, also I guess uh, uh, those are still in the uh, uh, considerations and uh, right now and. Uh, for sharing the uh, uh, the the cell side and the system, there are uh, tech technolo technology uh, challenges as well. And uh, in fact, we had uh, experience in 4G sharing with uh, China Unicorn, and uh, the uh, some of the difficulty comes from the fact that uh, uh, different uh, software provider in the same area may have different vendors, and with different equipment, and also uh, with a different OAM. Uh, 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 services and therefore uh, how to overcome those difficulties uh, become an issue however uh, uh, there are other, uh, other ideas now come uh, to flow uh, with the software provider is to uh, to share a network but do not share area it means that each software provider will build up uh, one city and the another software provider will build uh, another city and then we share the network. In that way, that seems to solve the, uh, the, the, the interoperability problem, OAM problem. And so those are the ideas we are considering right now. And however, um, also depends on how the license is allocated. And uh, uh, right now it's a theoretical study and we don't have uh, concrete uh, uh, steps right now. Now, if I, if, I, if I understand you correctly, that actually reminds me of uh, how some of the builds work in Canada, right? The, uh, the Canadian shared RAN LTE networks where one carrier, uh, one carrier has done one city, another carrier has done another city, they use each other's networks. But uh, uh, still, I think uh, there are uh, issues with that as well. And uh, I think uh, uh, fair to say that uh, the sharing uh, uh, is a uh, good uh, theoretical idea. However, how to implement it smoothly and, uh, uh, and that could be an uh, issue. And uh, I think uh, technology problem yet to be solved have not completed solved yet. So we constantly look into that as a, a, a research and a study. And so far, we uh, do not have plans for that right now. Now, Piera, uh, space resources have to be shared, right? Are, are, I mean, maybe, maybe I have a, uh, may, maybe I have uh, too, uh, you know, too, too optimistic a view of space. But in general, space resources are not held to one operator or another, right? So do you have new structures that you're developing as uh, mobile operators uh, are knocking on doors more often about space resources? Mm, well. For example, I'm not sure if I got the question, but if, for example, we talk about satellite communication, so the equivalent of the terrestrial communication, you will find satellite operators, and they will not be very, very happy to, to, sh to share, let's mm -hmm. say that, because, of course, their business case will be based on the capacity that they will sell. Mm -hmm. If we talk about Earth observation, of course, you will find um, some open source data, uh, but also there you will find companies who which base their business on selling their data. Um, so if we talk about space, we talk uh, about a sector where you do have the business, uh, where, okay, if on one side there is some aspect of sharing, on the other side there's a strong aspect of uh, making money, selling data, capacity. Uh, now, okay, don't talk, let's don't talk about positioning. Um, but you can find a lot of analogies and similarities with the terrestrial world. Okay. 
and so um, now one one other thing one other thing I was curious about uh, I, I was curious about from you is um, is the new uh, the, the new Skywan approach to uh, satellite backhaul and whether uh, that means that in the 5G world, mobile carriers are going to be looking to satellite backhaul more often, or in situations where they weren't looking towards it uh, in the 4G world. Um, is, that, is that something you have ideas about? And it sounds like, Thomas, you have some ideas about that, too. Uh, you want to go first? Okay. Um, well, if we want to look at now how the satellite can support a 5G, of course, the, the role it can have is to back the backhaul, uh, backhaul of uh, the base station or, um, of course, be there in case of uh, emergency, disaster response. Uh, if we want to think about a more long-term view, um, of course, you need to think about new constellations, which hopefully might meet uh, the uh, requirements and the, the numbers that you see in the, in the 5G terrestrial world. Um, so it depends from the time that you look at. For today, yes, we we'll definitely talk about backhaul. Mm -hmm. But in the future, I hope that there will come up constellation capable to be complementary to the terrestrials. Does yeah? D does the future of uh, does the future of satellite being a partner to 5G? Uh, does that affect how Ericsson is building or developing its products at all? So I think I think we see uh, multiple use of satellite, but primarily as, as backhaul. Uh, but of course, as, as we require greater coverage everywhere, you know, then, and we'll find coverage in places where it's difficult to find coverage today, then satellite, I think, is an excellent opportunity to, uh, to provide that backhaul. But I think the device, people want to use the same device everywhere. And there's enormous economy of scale, of course, in smartphones and other devices. So if we can keep that their interface and the user interface being the same and satellite provides the backhaul to the base station you provided, I think that's, that's very efficient. I also think that we will see 5G specifically be deployed in much lower bands than the, you know, uh, the mid bands 3.5, 4.9, 28 millimeter wave and so forth that we see, that we see today. As a matter of fact, um, if I may say, you know, if you've bought the Ericsson radio system since 2015, you know, you have here that is possible to, um, uh, to run 5G on. You can run it simultaneously with 4G. So th there is going to be a coverage layer smoothly introduced also for, for 5G in the world. Yeah, well, in, in the U.S., actually, uh, T-Mobile, one of our carriers, has said that they are doing uh, 5G all the way down at 600 megahertz That's right. in 20 to 30 megahertz channels um, for, for, for various uses. Uh, but um, now, that, of course, makes me think, Dr. B, um, you, you folks are doing an SA network, and that makes me think, well, then, you need very broad coverage. Um, so why not? Uh, why why won't why won't China Telecom look at or are you looking at implementing 5G in very low frequencies? Uh, definitely, we are looking at that because uh, eventually the uh, uh, some of the uh, spectrum uh, from the lower generation will be reformed, right? And uh, so, however, that's not the first step uh, because uh, the uh, the low frequencies are. Uh, most likely uh, to be uh, FDD, and uh, I believe the FDD development of the 5G is uh, behind or next to the uh, uh, TDD uh, development. And therefore, uh, we are uh, actively looking at uh, how to improve the, uh, uh, the coverage through the uh, use of the low frequencies. Uh, in addition, in fact, we are also uh, uh, considering how to enhance the current coverage uh, through other technology as well. So yes, we are considering it. However, that will be somewhere down the road. OK. OK, um, it looks like we are coming about up to time. Um, so I want to thank all of you for uh, coming down here for this panel. Uh, thank all of you for coming to watch this panel. It is, uh, yeah, it looks like it's just about lunchtime.
So uh, head on out to lunch and uh, head on back later in the afternoon. And there are, of course, more panels and more speakers going on throughout the conference throughout the day. Thank you all, and thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.